The world watched as Nelson Mandela, head of the African National Congress Party, the ANC, ushered South Africa out of apartheid and into a democratic era. We reaffirm our determination to build a society of which each of us can be proud. But while the new constitution guaranteed equal rights to all, after 25 years of ANC rule, South Africa is now the most unequal country on earth. Critics say one common denominator looms large, corruption. My guest tonight has played a key role in South Africa's modern history. From her time fighting apartheid to her role as South Africa's deputy president, ANC chair and speaker of the National Assembly. Presiding over what has been called a period of chaos in parliament. Relieve yourself of that chair and allow the deputy chairperson. Honorable Malema, you are out of order. So, has the ANC betrayed Mandela's legacy? Or will new president Cyril Ramaphosa set it back on the right track? I'm Mehdi Hassan and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Baleka Mbete. I'll ask her how successfully she thinks the ANC transitioned from a liberation movement to a ruling party and whether critics are right to say that it demands loyalty to itself above the country. I'll also be joined by Andrew Feinstein, former South African politician and author of After the Party, A Personal Journey Inside the ANC. He's now director of Corruption Watch UK. Makosi Koza, known as an anti-corruption politician who resigned from the ANC in 2017 after calling for then-President Zuma to step down. And Kolani Kala, founder of South African Business Abroad and member of the ANC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Baleka Mbete. <laughs> Returning from exile, Baleka Mbete became Secretary General of the ANC Women's League and rose through the ranks of the African National Congress to become one of her party's top six figures. <laughs> it's been 25 years since the end of apartheid. There's no doubt your country has come a long way in that time, but at the same time, the sad reality, many would say, is that the past decade of ANC rule has been a lost and wasted decade, hasn't it? No. Because for me, even every difficulty, every mistake, every failure is a lesson. And therefore, it's an opportunity to do better. So it hasn't been a lost decade? No. Because that's the view of Cyril Ramaphosa, the current ANC president of South Africa. I he called it agree. a lost and wasted decade. I don't agree. But it isn't just the president who said that. Others have gone much further than him. Uh, the Nelson Mandela Foundation has talked about the systematic looting that has taken place in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said as far back as 2011 that the ANC was, quote, worse than the apartheid government because he said, at least you were expecting it with the apartheid government. It's pretty damning. It is, and I remember that moment when the bishop said that, and uh, when we meet him, he doesn't really sound like that. I'm saying, Mehdi, wrong things have happened. Yes. People have done wrong things, but that doesn't mean it's all lost, it's all gloom. The ANC will be remembered for fighting for racial equality. Sure. Uh, but in economic terms, when we talk about inequality, the World Bank says that South Africa today is the most unequal nation on earth. That's a pretty embarrassing title for your country to hold, isn't it? I must say it is very harsh, but I wonder whether it's not an exaggeration. I really think that we must see both good and bad. It can be said by the World Bank, the World Bank is not God and therefore just because they've said it. I mean, to be fair, it's not between God and the World Bank. It's like, no, sure. I mean, those are extremes. They are an institution that studies yes, this stuff. Sure. I'm not sure they have some anti-South Africa but, agenda. But they they are human the numbers beings. and your country came bottom. They you don't are accept human that. beings. I don't so you believe, don't accept their verdict is what I you're don't saying. believe so. And we must keep improving on what we discover is a weakness that we have. And is corruption and one we, of those big weaknesses? You corruption have? is one of the reasons why we have the commission that is going on. 
where we are saying, let it all come out. Mm. Because we need to know what is wrong, how wrong it is, who did what. You're acting like you were a passerby or an observer. You were in the thick of all of this. No. In the ANC, you were the chair. You were the speaker in parliament. You were the deputy president. This happened on your watch, hence these questions. So, for example, back in 2017, your ANC colleague Praveen Gordon was sacked as finance minister by then President Jacob Zuma. He said at the time, 150 to 250 billion rand, or 11 to 15 billion US dollars, had been looted from the state. Why didn't you speak out at the time and, and, and join with him to call out that looting? I was right there, Mehdi, and we were discussing these issues every day at that time. We were seized with them. That is why we decided we need for these things to be investigated and we need for it to happen publicly in the open so that we get to know what exactly is the problem? But you're implying Who? that no one knew anything, that we're just discovering this now. The state capture, what's called state capture in South Africa, this idea that associates of the president and other powerful people took over utility companies, energy companies, state institutions, that happened in full view of everyone's eyes. Actually not. Things were not happening in you're, full view of everybody. The finance minister there disagreed are many, with you. There are many issues I'm learning for the first time okay. in the past few months. In terms of corruption? In terms of how bad things were. Okay. Something that happened that we don't need an investigation because there have been lots of investigations uh, was the scandal involving then President Zuma's own estate, the Encandler homestead, where nearly 23 million US dollars or 246 million rand of taxpayers' money was spent on what President Zuma described as security upgrades, which included a swimming pool and an amphitheater. I'm curious, what kind of security was the swimming pool providing the then president of South Africa? Well, a minister was in charge of that investigation, and in his view, that was not a swimming pool. This was the police minister, the president's yes, the police then... minister. He, he put out a video mm -hmm. to classical music mm -hmm. in which he described the swimming pool as a fire prevention measure. Yes. <laughs> he did. That's the report we got. And you, and you accepted that? Seriously? It's not up to me, Mehdi. It's not up to me. I didn't tell to... up to you. I said, did you agree with that assessment of... I mean, this is serious stuff. We can laugh, but $23 million on pools and amphitheaters in a country where half the population lives on less than $5 a day. You accept that let, kind let, of excuse? No, it's not a question of accepting or not accepting. Part of the challenge that we have is that part of that is actually government property, which was actually for purposes of ensuring that there are health facilities nearby for the president to, to be able to be looked after or any of the staff. In 2016, there was a landmark constitutional court ruling that said Jacob Zuma should pay some money back. It also ruled against the National Assembly that you were speaker yes. of, saying yes. you would, quote, fail to fulfill its constitutional obligations to hold the president accountable. That's, a, that's an indictment of you. Yes. You're the speaker of parliament. It's not an indictment of an individual because the individual actually does not determine the position that parliament or the National Assembly does actually end up taking. Court so case finally- case called Democratic Alliance versus Speaker of the National Assembly. Sure, That's you. Because I am the leader and yeah. therefore on, on behalf of the institution, I become the person who is quoted. Do you believe you were a neutral, impartial speaker? I was then why is it that you, as a neutral, impartial speaker, you had to apologise for calling an opposition leader, Julius Malema, a cockroach at an I, ANC rally? I use, is, that a, is that a neutral, impartial I term? I use in that term to, not in Parliament. So let's not... Oh, so you were only neutral in Parliament. Uh, Once I, you stepped outside of I, Parliament... I said were, that in a, in a political context. I was in the North West... So why did you apologise? You don't sound very because apologetic Because it was not correct for me to call... Okay. Another person, a cockroach, whether they were... I'm, I'm glad we can agree on that. Uh, just looking forward, South Africa has a new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, who claims to be determined to stamp out corruption, mm -hmm. even though he himself has been accused of misleading parliament over a campaign donation. And even though out of 21 corruption scandals during the ANC's 25 years in office, just one senior party figure has been brought to account in terms of going to jail. How can anyone have confidence in the current ANC government to clean things up when only one person went to prison. 
I think you have seen the actions of the president, how he has dealt with the issues of strengthening the institutions of governance, strengthening in particular the, 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 the justice system, bringing in people who are going to act differently, people who are going to have the courage and to do things focused on correcting uh, what has been wrong in the system. Just on that one person who was sent to prison, uh, this was the ANC's former chief whip, Tony Yengeni, who was sent to jail for fraud. Uh, I believe you accompanied him to the prison gates. How is that not putting your party and your alliances above the interests of parliament and the country? I accompanied uh, Comrade Tony because I did not believe in what he, he was being said to have done. And I accompanied him as a comrade. So you don't accept the court's verdict in, in a democratic South I'm Africa. not saying that. I'm just telling you that I accompanied my comrade and I don't feel guilty for that. You don't. Can you tell our viewers what position uh, Tony Yengeni, this ex-convict, was appointed to by the ANC last year? Position? Yeah, he was appointed to chair of the working group on corruption. Does that make one, sense? One thing I know... To have a person who went to prison running your working group... did something wrong... ...on corruption? In the ANC political life... Yeah. ...we look at things sometimes not exactly the way other people yeah, see I them. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, let's go to our panel uh, who are waiting to come in. I'm joined by Makosi Kosa, a former ANC MP who resigned from the party in 2017 after calling for President Zuma to step down following corruption allegations. In your view, Makosi, and you were there for a lot of this period, did the ANC fail to hold President Zuma to account? Did the Speaker fail to hold the then President to account, in your view? Of course, yes. Um, I think they did fail to hold him to account. And uh, in fact, some of us that were speaking out against what we saw as an attack on the Constitution and on the social contract were persecuted. And um, especially Mambalega is somebody that I held in high esteem as somebody who molded me as a young person. And as a feminist, I expected that I ought to have received some kind of support from her. So from that point of view, I honestly do think that in terms of injudiciousness, leadership injudiciousness, yeah. I think they have to prove themselves if they are to be believed. Did you fail to give Makosi Kosa the support she needed? Did you let her down? I didn't let her down. She and I had a, a quick exchange outside just to agree that we have stuff to catch up on. And we will do that. <laughs> OK. I mean, I'm all for you catching up. But just for the purposes of the people watching around the world and in this room, do you want to deal with the point she made and, that you and, let her down as a feminist, as an MP trying to hold the president account? You weren't there to back her up. I was there to back her up when she needed security. I made sure that we should look into the issues of what kind of support Parliament had to ensure she had. And we dealt with that very fairly, very focusedly. Okay. Um, Kolani Kala is the executive chairman of South African Business Abroad, a member of the ANC. Do you think people have faith in the ANC to deal with this corruption issue that's been festering on their watch, especially given the current president has his own campaign donation issues going on? Well, look, uh, South Africans have a huge faith in the African National Congress. You mm. must remember that we inherited a situation where we have an infrastructure that was not capable to assist our people. Hospitals were only designed for the privilege. The majority of black people were unable to attend hospitals. If you are going to universities, they were not there catering for black people. So with all that, the government of the ANC have done so much for the South African people. It is for that reason alone that they keep voting for them. Yes. But I must add something else here. The fact that I'm having this privilege to have this dialogue, discussion with you in United Kingdom, it is also that the government of the ANC, we were not allowed as black people to be able to sit here and talk freely. Yeah. It was a criminal offense for me to be here. Okay. The last thing I wanted to say, it oh, comes to the corruption issue. Very briefly. When it happens in Africa, we label it as corruption. But it happens in the House of Commons. Mm. MPs are claiming two houses, and we call it a scandal. Okay. But when it's in Africa, it's corruption. So let's label these things okay. as it is.
That's fair point. A very fair point. Let me bring in Andrew Feinstein, who's another former ANC MP who resigned back in 2001. He's author of After the Party, A Personal Journey Inside the ANC. He's now director of Corruption Watch UK. Uh, Andrew, you said you left the ANC because the government at the time refused to investigate corruption uh, properly. How bad has the corruption issue become for the South African government, not just under Thabo Mbeki, but Jacob yep. Zuma and now Cyril Ramaphosa? First of all, Mehdi, I think that Kolani's point is very well taken. I think that we mustn't lose sight of what has been done in 25 years of democracy, yes. nor lose sight of the fact that what we inherited was a systemically corrupt system. Yeah. The biggest problem has been, however, that our own leadership, including Comrade Mbete, who's been a very important leader of our liberation struggle and of our democratic era, have not been prepared to call out colleagues in leadership who have engaged in corruption. And that started all those years back with the arms deal that I tried to investigate, in which South Africa spent $10 billion on weapons that we neither needed nor barely used. And the primary reason that was done is because around $300 million of bribes were paid. And unfortunately, then President Thabo Mbeki was prepared to undermine our institutions of democracy, including parliament, that he and many others had sacrificed so much to bring about in order to cover up corruption. Okay. If that had been stopped then, I don't think we would have gone on to the state capture crisis, the Inkandla crisis. So let me put that point to you. Did you never feel the need to call out Thabo Mbeki or Jacob Zuma, or did you just feel you couldn't? You were in the big six in the, the leadership of the party. You know, there is a tendency to be in a hurry for things to be done, positions to be taken against people before the actual investigation has been done. But you're acting like this has just popped up now. As these things were happening, you were being criticised. You don't just get a report from someone and they declare whatever they say, whatever they believe you must do, and you just rush off and do it. You've got to up apply your own mind into whatever people are saying. OK. Right? Andrew, Andrew's desperate to come back in very briefly, Andrew. These are constitutional bodies. There was a report from the Auditor General about corruption in the arms deal in 2000. Parliament decided unanimously to conduct a multi-agency investigation into it. It was the leadership of the ANC that stopped that investigation because leadership of the ANC were themselves complicit. And this has been the problem time after time. The information has been there from constitutionally okay. mandated bodies. Okay. Uh, another big topic uh, that's in the news, especially right now in South Africa. In recent months, your country's seen an increase in violent xenophobic attacks. Um, Foreign-owned shops ransacked, protests and chants of foreigners must go back to where they've come from. How worried are you about the, this rise in violent racism? We are very worried. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, statements not only from the president himself, both in South Africa and in uh, neighboring countries. For instance, when he went to President Mugabe's funeral, he took the opportunity to apologize and put a perspective on what had happened. It was not only foreign nationals that were killed. Many South Africans were also yeah. victimized in that public violence. Our Minister of International Relations has actually been having a meeting with all uh, embassies or yeah. um, ambassadors. I mean, you say that you're worried, you say the president's worried, and yet ANC ministers have kind of helped escalate this crisis. You have the Deputy Minister of Police a couple of years ago saying foreigners have taken over the city centres in Johannesburg. He said, we fought for this land, we cannot surrender it to foreign nationals. The then Health Minister blamed overcrowded hospitals and diseases on foreigners. This is the kind of far-right, xenophobic rhetoric that we see in other parts of the world leading to violence. This is not helpful. We know recently at a meeting we had as the National Executive Committee led by the President and the top six with all our branches in Johannesburg, discuss this issue. Yep. And we took a leadership position that said, we must correct whoever is involved so, in criminal activity. So you say, you, you say it went out to branch leaders. Did the ANC Premier of Hauteng, David Makura, did he not get the memo? Because he said this year, some specific crimes are committed by specific nationalities. Drugs, there are specific nationalities. How do we have so many drug dens that are operated by Nigerians? 
Is that helpful rhetoric when people are being attacked? It's not helpful, but it's also true. It's true, what's true? In certain cases, people have been found to be guilty of running drug Who are Nigerian. businesses. Some Nigerians. And literally and 10 many seconds ago, you said there well. are many South Africans as well. So I'm confused, South Africans I'm confused as well. where you stand. On the one hand, you're saying we shouldn't single them out. On the other hand, you're saying it's true what he says when he yes, singles them out. It is true. When it's true, it's true. But I do condemn a statement that makes it sound like all Nigerians are doing all the criminality there is in Johannesburg, when in fact we ourselves are also involved. Because he goes up. The How worried are you? The truth about what is currently happening is that you have a chronically cro corrupt police service. If you know that there are people that are, are drug trafficking or they are doing something, why are you not arresting them? Because that is a crime. But to attribute that to a specific nationality, it is xenophobic. Because you are basically inciting the, the communities to rise against foreigners. Because they will start looking at foreigners as the people that are bringing in drugs. When that drug trafficking is happening in collusion with the police. Yes. And Kolani, do you, do you agree with that? Disagree with that? Well, Mendy, I, I must take this opportunity once again. My president has done this in South Africa. And I think... Uh, uh, the guests here have done that today, to apologize even to any other ordinary African here or relative with an African uh, heritage, to apologize on behalf of the South Africans in the diaspora of what have happened. But when there's a criminal elements, yeah. let's be able to point them up. By race, I, nationality. I didn't say that. I mean, if okay, you somebody know, no, 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 hold on, have hold on, done hold criminal on. activities, with respect, let that I need to, no, no, hold be on, I need to jump in here. When former President Thabo Mbeki said, in September, yes. the truth of the matter is that there are Nigerian criminals who are involved in drug dealing. And that's true. There is no South African that goes around chasing Nigerians because they are Nigerians. Is that not denialism of the problem by a no, former president? Let me give you more information. Hold on, do you agree with that no, statement? No, no, I have to give you what no, I no, know. No, you need... The president has said what he has said. Okay. But statistics and the report says to us now, 16 people have passed away on the recent incident in South Africa. Okay. Out of the 16, there's no, way, no, there's no one from Nigeria. Okay. 14 are South African, one is from Malawi. Why are we not talking about that as facts? Okay, well, let's Rather put that, to let me bring in Andrew there. Feinstein. It's not a problem. There's no issue Two with the very Nigerians quick being points. killed. The first is that a key root of this problem are the levels of economic inequality that you mentioned mm. in South Africa. And these have to be addressed. Mm. These have to be addressed by our leadership. Mm -hmm. The second problem is a lack of accountability of leaders when they make statements, like you mentioned, from the premier of the Gauteng province. That is completely unacceptable. That is the language of Trump and Farage. That is not the language that should be coming from the leadership of a liberation movement with the proud tradition and history of the African National Congress. Do you agree with that? Do you think the, and, you think the and, ANC and, leadership uh, should stop using the language of Trump and Farage? That, those are his words. And I'm asking you if you agree with them. Is it xenophobic? It is, isn't it? It is. If it and is People in your focused. party are guilty of xenophobia. Some people, not all. Senior people. Some. Senior. Some, some senior people. Yes. OK, I'm glad we can agree on that. On that note... Uh, it's time for a break after a very lively first half. Uh, join me after the break for part two of Head to Head, where we'll hear from our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union and continue our discussion of the ANC's legacy. Tune in. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. My guest today is Ms. Baleka Mbete, former Speaker of the South African Parliament, former Deputy President of South Africa. Uh, we were talking in part one about the political economic legacy of ANC rule. What are the low points, many would argue, of that period was during President Thabo Mbeki's time in office between 1999 and 2008 and his denialist positions around AIDS and HIV and his refusal to allow antiretrovirals which led, according to a Harvard University study, to more than 330,000 uh, premature deaths. As someone who was an ally of President Mbeki at the time, as someone who was deputy speaker and then speaker of parliament at that time, what do you say to your critics 
who say that he and you were effectively complicit in those unnecessary deaths, hundreds of thousands of people. The way you are putting it, Mehdi, is as if we sat and actually plotted that thousands of people must die. No, it was not like that. It was a process, of course. And our role as parliament, through the, the, the relevant portfolio committee of health, is to exercise oversight hmm. over what the executive is doing. Did you do it? And it's not as though the health committee was seized with the issues. The whole world was trying to find out what's the best thing to do. And I must say that it has been said internationally that South Africa was one of the countries where the best was being tried at all times. Yes, all we made, times? All times we made mistakes, yes. We did make mistakes. Did you ever have a frank conversation? with Tabo Mbeki about his weird views on this subject that led to so many deaths? Did you ever talk to him about him claiming not to know anyone who died of AIDS? Him saying there's no link between HIV and AIDS? His health minister suggesting you eat beetroot and garlic to combat AIDS? Did you ever push back against any of that ridiculousness? Mehdi, it was not for me personally. Why? You were to, the Speaker of Parliament, talk, because, member of the NEC, because I was chair of the ANC. Busy with Parliament, I was busy with all busy. issues. Busy? People were dying? Yes, very busy. People were and dying? Yes, people were dying, including in my own family. But it does not mean we conspired and actually plotted that people should die. Mistakes were happening, people were making efforts. Was it a mistake to say eat beetroot and garlic to yes. combat? Yes. That's more than a mistake. That's it, madness. It led, it, well, you call it madness. What and, do you uh, call it? I can only call it an unfortunate moment in the history of South Africa. It seems like an understatement, given we very, know how many very, people died. Very, very unfortunate moment. And uh, indeed, we have since come deaths, out. And you use the language unfortunate moment. We have moment. since come out of Lament. that. And we've done actually much better than we ever thought we were going to do. That is true. Yes. You have improved. Things I'm have glad, changed. I'm glad I'm asking about the that. period when people were dying and you didn't seem to be doing anything because you say you were too busy. Mehdi, I'm not a doctor. I couldn't, even if I wanted I mean, to. Couldn't you have said, Mr. President, you're wrong. Even in private, if you didn't want to do it publicly, why didn't you do that? I never had a private moment with Tabombeg. You weren't on the National Executive I was, Committee of the ANC? I was, but that's not a private Okay, moment. in a room full of you and your fellow senior colleagues, couldn't you have said, I think this is wrong? The subcommittee of health in the ANC was the one that was focusing on this matter, and therefore that's why, as we speak today, we're totally out of those woods that we were in. Well, other people at the time were speaking up, and one of them was former President Nelson Mandela. He made a passionate plea at the ANC National Executive Meeting in 2002 to at least distribute antiretroviral drugs to pregnant women with HIV. But he was heckled by party members at that meeting. Mandela was heckled. He later said it was one of the lowest moments of his career, but it was a low moment for the ANC too, wasn't it? You don't think it was a low you, moment? You want me to say no? No, of course, it's, it was a low moment. I mean, one witness, the former government minister, Nwako Ramatlodi, says ANC members were like a pack of wild dogs tearing at their prey, the prey being Nelson Mandela. Only two members defended Mandela's right to speak out for antiretrovirals. Only two. But what's the point, Mehdi, in you recalling all this about that moment? What is the point? How, how does it take us forward? Accountability. Yes, it's the past. Yes. We have since come out of there yes. and we are now doing way better than what happened at okay, that time. Okay, and the families of the people who died might want some accountability. And you are not going to get it from this woman who's sitting Why? here tonight. Why? Because you were there. I don't, You're a key player. My presence there did not make me have the wherewithal at that time to understand even what the debate was about. Okay. Um, isn't one of the fundamental problems with the ANC as a result of your history as a liberation movement that party loyalty and discipline and unity is always put before everything else and criticism debate is shut down, whether it's on issues around corruption under President Zuma or AIDS under President Mbeki, the party sticks together and doesn't say anything publicly about the bad leadership. You know, Mehdi, right now there's a commission of inquiry headed by the 
Deputy Chief Justice. The Zondo Commission. The Zondo Commission. Why we have that commission is because of a discussion of the National Executive Committee of the ANC. And a number of meetings insisted that we needed such a commission. And that is why, finally, that commission was created. Very late in the day. Very after late. Eight, after years of Zuma. Very late in the day, I agree with you. Because, in you fact... You were saying that Jacob in, Zuma should finish his term in, in, in Parliament, no. You are not telling the truth yourself now. Did you not say that? No. You never said that? OK, that's uh, on record. The point I was making is that in Parliament, we kept saying to the president, President, please form the Judicial Commission of Inquiry so that we can get on with this inquiry into how, in fact, was this ca state capture happening. And yet President Jacob Zuma said in 2015 that the ANC comes before the country. That's a bit of a shocking statement for the president of a country to make, isn't it? So he made it. Did you condemn him at the time for making it? Why should I condemn? Do you agree with the statement? I don't. So then why not say you disagree? Why Aren't you proving his point? Why? You're proving his point. I, no. But no one will criticize me for no, the ANC. No, no, maybe. The ANC is this, above the country. This mechanical thing of why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you scream at that moment? Why didn't, didn't you shout? Scream. You could have said it softly. No. <laughs> the point, though, is that the, if a person did not respond, the way you want them to have responded does that. not mean they necessarily agreed. So you disagreed quietly in private? Yes. OK. Let's go to the panel who are waiting uh, to come in. I'm joined by Andrew Feinstein, former ANC MP who resigned in 2001, author of the book After the Party, A Personal Journey Inside the ANC. You were an MP for the first two years, I think, of President Thabo Mbeki's term. Is it fair to say that the debate over HIV, AIDS, antiretrovirals was shut down, even when raised by someone like Nelson Mandela? On the 28th of September in the year 2000, Thabo Mbeki had just been at the United Nations, where he had been forced to say that he was withdrawing from the science of the relationship between HIV and AIDS. He returned to an ANC caucus meeting on that date, and he said, I have not changed my views. HIV does not cause AIDS. The vast majority of MPs, including the leadership, okay. cheered Thabo Mbeki's statement. This was as the corrupt arms deal was taking place. And the reason I link those two very quickly is because those 330,000 avoidable deaths, the 32,000 babies who were born HIV positive every year for five years after that, according to Harvard University, was at the time that we were saying we did not have the financial resources to provide antiretroviral medication, but okay. we were spending $10 billion on weapons that we didn't need because of the okay. bribes. And it speaks finally, Mehdi, to the issue of accountability. And this is where the ANC has failed itself and the people so of me, South Africa. So let me put that point uh, to Kalani Kala, who is chairman of the South African Business Abroad and a member of the ANC. Deal with that point that Andrew's making, you know, 330,000 deaths, 32,000 babies born a year with HIV. Is that a stain on the conscious, not just of South Africa, but specifically of the ANC, in your view? Well, uh, many things has been, have, have happened, uh, many. We feel sorry about it, but let's be honest about two things here. The government of the African National Congress, its own members at large, they go to a national policy conference. They discuss policies, how to help those who are suffering from this disease in South Africa. I think there's a perception here that the media didn't translate. President Thabo Mbeki never actually denied the treatment must be given. He was actually looking for a long-term treatment, not how Was it a treatment that involved beetroot and garlic? <laughs> well, others may, so be, may say beetroot is not part and parcel of it. But President was saying, let's look also at the nutrition, how to help our people, how to look at the long-term prevention. Andrew, you're shaking your head very briefly. Why are you shaking Very your quickly. Head? I mean, Thabo Mbeki said explicitly that antiretrovirals kill. The problem is that Thabo Mbeki bought into the dissident science on HIV and AIDS. And to his credit, Jacob Zuma did not and ultimately rejected it. But hundreds of thousands of South Africans avoidably lost their lives. 
Okay. Uh, Makosi Kose is a former ANC MP who resigned in 2017 after calling for President Zuma to step down following corruption allegations. Uh, Makosi, I asked uh, Ms. Mbete about whether party loyalty is considered to be more important in the ANC than the interests of the country. She said she disagreed with Jacob Zuma's statement, which he made in 2015, saying the ANC is above the country. Is that an accurate description of how the ANC and its leaders behave? Well, uh, certainly from the experience that I have, because I chose to abide by the constitution of the country, but I was disciplined for not adhering to the party position. Notwithstanding that, I do want to comment though on this HIV AIDS issue. Yes. I really do think that we have to admit that at its initial stages, it was tragic. A lot of women in particular lost their lives and I don't think we should sugarcoat our mistake. We should admit. But what is good is that the ANC yes. did at some point listen to civil society mm. and they did adhere to the will of the people and hence the many lives were saved. Okay. Um, on that note, we're going to shift to our audience who've been waiting here in the Oxford Union uh, to come in. Let us go to the lady here in the second row. Thank you. Dumela, Mam Paleka. While the state was being looted, universities were being chronically underfunded. And in 2015 and 2016, the Fees Must Fall movement shook the country and put this on the national agenda. Many of us suffered injuries uh, from police brutality at the time. In fact, some students were killed Benjamin Pehla was killed at TUT by police. How do you as an activist reconcile that the policing in South Africa right now by the ANC is reminiscent of the policing under apartheid that you yourself were a victim of as an activist at the time? Thank you. I think where police have been brutal the law must take its course against them as well. And so we as government cannot be happy with uh, bad elements among the police, elements that still exhibit signs of really actually being more like the old order. And therefore I agree with you that where police are behaving brutally, they should also be dealt with as criminals. No one has been held accountable. They are, because I know with the Minister of Police we discuss these issues, and in fact there is a program putting an eye on the conduct of the police themselves. Is this a different Minister of Police to the one who made the swimming pool video? No, yes, it's a new minister. Um, let's go to the back. Um, good, good evening, Mambaleka. We find ourselves in what can be termed as the perfect storm as a nation in South Africa. And we find ourselves at a time that we're deeply divided and we're also all introspecting as a nation. Could you kindly share what your outlook is for South Africa, especially for young people, and also what your message would be to potential young leaders to convince them to stay in South Africa? Thank you. So what's your message to young leaders to stay in South Africa? I think young leaders must know that South Africa the future of our country, in fact, must be their concern. They must be involved. They must find forums where they must participate in different uh, sectors where they can also contribute towards becoming uh, active uh, decision makers about their own future. Okay. Uh, let's go. I said this gentleman will get this gentleman in the corner. You said the police in South Africa have been held accountable, but my question is for the Marikana incident on the 16th of August, no one has been brought account to that. So, what are you doing about it? Is there a growing culture of impunity in South Africa? He's asking about the Marikana massacre 2012, 34 mine workers who were killed by police. No one's been held to account for that seven years later. What are you doing to hold people, the police accountable now? I'll find out. I, I'll, I'll get myself enough, better informed. Enough. Hold on, the Marikana massacre is a big story. Of course, I know, story. I know it. It's you not need that. To find out more it's, information it's, about I'm it. just saying I have to update my information. But you're aware no one's being held to account for the killing of 34 people. Some of them were <laughs> shot I'm in the back. I'm not sure about that. That's why I must find out. I mean, we're pretty sure because we looked into it. 34 people, um, no one's being held to no, account. No, I know that. I know how many people died. 
Uh, I think very briefly, Colonel. The commission of police, if you remember very carefully, she was recalled from her position. Okay. Mm. So something have happened there. Wow, 34 people dead and someone got fired. You said nothing have happened, I'm responding. I meant in terms of process, I'm guessing he meant in terms of putting people in prison for killing people and shooting them in the back. The audience member asked about people going to prison. You, you're aware that no police officer went to prison specifically for killing any of those 34 people. Is that wrong? Was that wrong? I'm saying my own information needs to be updated. Okay. And if it's updated and find out that nobody went to prison, is that wrong? Do you think someone wrong. should have gone to prison it for killing? It would be wrong, of course, because people were killed. Yes. Okay. This gentleman here in the brown jacket. Do you want? To... Um, in 2017, you said, um, following the fall of Robert Mugabe in a military coup in Zimbabwe, when, and I'm quoting your words, when one member of the first family, i.e. Grace Mugabe, thinks she has the right to determine who should be thrown out of the ruling party, um, I think anybody, you meant the military in this case, has the right and responsibility to intervene. Now, since 2017, a civilian military coalition government has taken over in Zimbabwe. There have been abductions, shootings by the military in the street, economic um, downturn, and persistent risk of another coup. My question is, do you still think uh, militaries have a responsibility to intervene in politics in light of these developments? Did you support a military intervention in Zimbabwe? I thought it was great. That okay. intervention okay. was politically motivated. Okay. It happened to be an initiative of military people. Do you call it a people. coup? Was it a coup? Was it a military be coup? Because it was the military, then I guess coup will do. But I'm saying there was a crisis busy unfolding okay. in Zimbabwe. Do so you think it was better for that to happen? I think that intervention helped ZANU-PF. Okay. We're going to have to go back to the audience. Uh, I said I'd go to the back. Gentleman in the glasses there. My grandmother and mother took care of ANC cadres and taught them how to create an education system in Harare. They remember you. I was one of the people with the open border policy in South Africa who was able to become a doctor and a Rhodes Scholar here. And I only became a citizen in South Africa a month ago. I am deeply hurt that people like me have no future in the country because we are seen as being Zimbabweans and Nigerians who conduct crime. How can I tell my girlfriend to come back to South Africa with me to contribute for a future? Can you please take this opportunity to think about your views with your heart when people like my grandmother fought for your liberation in South Africa not knowing when it would come? Okay. Can I? Hey. It is exactly because, as the ANC, we've been thinking with our hearts that we are in the problem that we have. Where we were hoping it will work for us all to live together in our communities, unlike where we lived in, in, in refugee camps when we were in other countries. And unfortunately, it has not worked. And what we are saying is, let us sit down together with you and your girlfriend and talk about the reality, Just to the be clear, challenges. are you saying you want to see, to, to use kind of quote-unquote Western lingo, tougher border controls, tougher migration policies, less immigrants? Is that what you're trying to say? We've got, we've got to manage who's coming into the borders, like every country does, every country does not just allow anyone to come in without proper documents and come and do as you like. You're not worried about, you're not if, worried about scapegoating immigrants for South Africa's problems. And even breaking laws of the country, very, okay, very, which we don't allow in other okay, countries. Okay, very briefly, Makosi wants to I'm come in, very briefly. I'm deeply disturbed by what I'm hearing because um, this, this means that South Africa will never be developed. Because if we as South Africans are going to take an exceptionalist view, that means we will never be able to integrate our economies. South Africa, in Chinese terms, is just a village. We are only 56 million people. Okay. And, and I think we ought to begin to think broader than just thinking of South Africa as a little island in, in exceptional terms. Okay. Uh, I said I'll come to this gentleman here and then we'll go to the gentleman behind. Yes. Yeah, good evening. I just want to ask why is it so difficult for ANC government
to solve a land issue problem in your country. Because 72% of farmland is owned by white minority. That's where the problem is, which you are facing right now. It's going to be a time bomb. Do you want to answer? It is a problem. I agree with you. We must deal with it. We have not been great at it in the past two decades or two and a half decades, and we are seized with it right now. Gentleman, white t-shirt. President Ramaphosa named a cabinet consisting of 50% of women. Uh, so do you think in the next um, decade maybe we'll have a woman president? Thank you. I hope so. Yeah? Do you want to throw your hat in the ring or younger? No. Gentleman? Okay. That gentleman here. Um, so an article in 2017 by Biz News uh, referred to the ANC government as an organized crime syndicate and levels of criminality in the government have reached such stages where they've uh, resulted in a breaking down of moral and social fiber of the country, and violent crime has flourished to extreme levels where there's on average 56 murders and 110 rapes every single day. My question is, because there seems to be a theme of denial both here tonight and not taking responsibility for anything, what responsibility do you take as a senior member of the ANC? Okay. I think we can't blame the problems of South African society on the ANC. Criminality has been in South Africa for more than three centuries, especially after the colonialists came and brought crime from Europe to Africa. And, so you can't and, say the, the, but, but the, the on, ANC on, brought, on, brought, on, brought on, criminality. We're sitting in the UK, let's be clear. The British Empire did do exactly what you just said, but they did it to a lot of countries. Why is it South Africa has the fifth highest murder rate in the world in 2015? I'm wondering who says that. Uh, the United Nations, you may have heard of them. They're a big <laughs> organization. So what? If they, so what? Okay. So, so no UN, insane. no World Bank. We're way over on time. So this is going to have to be the last question. I hope it's a really good one. No pressure. Oh. Former Speaker, welcome to this place. Uh, my question is, in light of where South Africa finds itself in, both politically, economically, and even socially. Um, how do you see your role in the facilitation of the erosion of public institutions in South Africa, and what would you have done differently? That is a good question. <laughs> I have no me outside of the collective. That is my home politically. You don't that think you is, personally, as an individual politician, could have done anything differently over the last 10 years? I don't have a personal space to do things you know, personally, as an individual. Really? No. OK. One last question from me. Chris Harney, the anti-apartheid icon who was killed 26 years ago, he said in October 1992, what I fear is that the liberators emerge as elitists who drive around in Mercedes Benzes and use the resources of this country to live in palaces and gather riches. Was he rather prophetically describing the South Africa of 2019, the ANC to of 2019? Extent, to a certain extent, yes. As we've been finding out about the kinds of things that uh, some of us, some of our own people have been doing. And I'm saying it's not a bad thing that that is coming out. It's actually a good thing because then only can we address it. On that note, Ms. Baleka and Betty will have to leave it there. Thanks to our audience here in the Oxford Union. Thanks to our panel of experts here. And thank you to you for joining us head to head. We'll be back next year. Thanks for watching at home. Thank you.